Welcome to the Lorraine Hallis Lecture on the Art and Science of Caregiving. I'm Stephanie Shivers. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer here at Caring Kind and the VP of Program Development. And I have the privilege of being the moderator tonight. This lecture series was created in the memory of Lorraine Hallis and is sponsored with the generous support of the Hallis family. The Lorraine Hallis Lecture on the Art and Science of Caregiving is designed to recognize caregiving as an important social, political, policy, and spiritual issue that merits thoughtful discussion and discourse. Lorraine's daughter, Doreen Skolnick, served as her primary caregiver, and she's joining us here in, from Connecticut to say a few words tonight. Um, Doreen wanted to be here with us in person and is not able to, which is why we've had a little bit of technology to, <laughs> to get into the room. And so if you'll bear with us, um, we want to invite Doreen to say a few words. I want to start off by saying that over the years, so many friends and relatives continually questioned my decision to have my mother in my home. My mother stayed with my family for 12 years. Was it easy? No. But did it work? Yes. It really worked because of the incredible support from my own family who continued to show her love and devotion. My youngest daughter would come home from school every day and snuggle on the couch with her bubby. And I still remember how Bubby would stroke her and hold her close, instinctively trying to care for her. My children and then my grandchildren helped to take care of her. They would feed her. They would be there for her. They would support her. And my thought that we all, through the whole process of the ups and downs, bottom line is we gave her love. But So which I feel was one of the key things, and more than that is that we provided her with a sense of normalcy. We had no guide. We just worked and did everything from the heart, which is how I think we got through all those years. I am so looking forward to this discussion by Dr. Shaw, as I feel it is such an important discussion for all of us as caregivers. And at this opportunity, I also need to thank my brother, Jeffrey, my sister-in-law, Nancy, for supporting this very important series that families really need and that we all have gone through. Thank you again. Thank you. Ed was the primary care partner for his late wife, Rebecca. Inspired by Rebecca's Alzheimer's journey, his medical interest shifted from oncology to dementia care and support. He was actually quite an accomplished physician in, um, in brain cancer and researcher prior to his becoming a counselor. With additional training and mental health counseling, Ed founded the Memory Counseling Program in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Since its beginning in 2011, this program has benefited thousands of families. Dr. Shaw generously shares his personal experiences and his professional expertise through seminars, talks like this, trainings, and four books, which you so saw hopefully on the way in and are available for you. Keeping Love Alive as Memory Fades, The Five Love Languages and the Alzheimer's Journey with co-authors Deborah Barr and Dr. Gary Chapman. The Dementia Care Partners Workbook, a leader's manual for dementia care partner support groups, and a support group for people living with dementia, the leader's manual. We're very grateful for these resources. We're grateful to have Ed here with us tonight. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Shaw and welcome him. Thank you. All right. Hey, good evening, everybody. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, known Stephanie for some time and uh, the Caring Kind organization is um, just an incredible resource to have here in New York to support families on the journey. And um, so I'm also very glad to, um, to have my wife is here, Claire, who 
I'll talk about a little bit later. Also privileged to have my big brother here, uh, Mark, who is a therapist here in New York City. And he came to make sure I didn't say anything that I'm not supposed to. And some other friends who I've known in the past, but have met. Um, and mostly thank you for each of you, both in person and online for, for coming to this talk tonight. So I look forward to this. Okay. Yeah, I, I wish I still looked like that, actually. <laughs> um, so I, I want to begin and just maybe share some facts and figures that you've seen or heard before. But we are, you know, we, we think about pandemics and epidemics a lot because of COVID. But we're actually in this country and worldwide, we're in an epidemic of dementia, of Alzheimer's disease. We have 7 million people in the United States living with Alzheimer's or another type of dementia. And by 2050, which is only a quarter century away, that number is almost going to double to 13 million. So since the year 2000, um, we've made so many advances in the treatment of heart disease, both prevention and treatment, that the death, that death from heart disease has decreased 7% while death from dementia has increased 145%. But the good news is that this year in 2023, just a few months ago, the FDA approved the first ever treatment to slow the progression and hopefully eventually prevent this terrible disease. So there is promise for change in the future. One in three seniors dies either with or from dementia. Um, and dementia deaths now account for uh, more deaths than both breast cancer in women and prostate cancer in men combined. In fact, a woman now is more likely to die from dementia than she is from breast cancer. When I went to medical school 40 years ago, that wasn't the case. The cost of dementia care is immense. These are actually pre-COVID numbers. The national burden is about a third of a billion dollars and it's projected to be a trillion dollars uh, a year by 2050. And now with Medicare approving uh, the use of these new drugs that will be used to treat and slow the progression, that number is even an underestimate. And that will be the number one healthcare expenditure in our country is for the treatment of people living with dementia. The average cost of care, again, these are pre-COVID numbers, the average annual cost is $65,000. And so for a disease that has an eight to 10 year journey, you do the math that the typical family will spend a half a million, two thirds of a million dollars caring for their loved one with dementia. Think of the impact of that. So what is dementia? So I'm gonna show two slides that talk about what is dementia. So sort of from a big picture, big picture perspective, Dementia is the most common of the family of diseases we call in medicine the neurodegenerative diseases. So you've heard of Parkinson's disease or Lou Gehrig's disease. These are also neurodegenerative disease. And so these are diseases that affect the brain, the structure and the function of the brain. And for dementia, it causes eventually shrinkage of the brain. So sometimes I hesitate about showing this picture. On the left, if you were to take a saw and cut my head open, put a hinge on my ear and fold my head in half, what you would see is what the normal brain looks like on the left. And on the right is the picture of, this is an actual picture of someone's brain who died from their journey with dementia and the brain shrinks. So when we talk about the other definition of dementia, we talk about the effect of this neurodegenerative disease uh, called dementia on the function of the brain, but we also talk about the effect on the function of the person, the consequence of that functional loss. So our brain very simply does five things. So that's the definition of cognitive function. It pays attention, which you're all doing a very good job of right now, maybe except for my brother right here. Um, 
It helps us remember. We talk about memory as short-term memory and long-term memory. Memory is actually a very complicated function. Our brain multitasks, sometimes called executive function, planning, problem solving, multitasking, judgment, insight, you know, the things we need to do that take steps. Our brain helps us with language. It helps us understand what we hear, what you're doing now, and then it helps us with our spoken language. And then lastly, uh, but not least, our spatial skills, navigating our th the three-dimensional world that we live in. People living with dementia often have falls because they have difficulty with navigation, going up and down stairs, up and down a curb, even walking across a crack in the sidewalk. So we pay attention, we remember, we multitask, we uh, speak, and we navigate the world. That's the basic five cognitive functions. And someone who has dementia, one or more of those cognitive functions doesn't work as well. In Alzheimer's disease, it's memory. Memory is affected first and it's affected worst. And there are other kinds of dementia. There's actually 40 different types of dementia, but the, there's four that are sort of the most common. And um, in order to really um, expand on those, we've stretched out the talk tonight to three hours. <laughs> so we'll have you out of here by nine. Um, I'm just kidding. So that would be a whole talk in and of itself to talk about the different types of dementia. So the, the diagnosis of dementia, when we make that diagnosis medically, we test the person's cognitive function. And then if they have a decline in cognitive function, to actually meet the diagnosis of dementia, they also have to have functional decline. If somebody has difficulty with their memory, but they're functioning normally, they might meet the criteria for what's called mild cognitive impairment, which is like pre-Alzheimer's disease or pre-dementia. But to actually have dementia, there has to be functional issues. And that means that the person needs assistance doing the activities they more normally do, or they might need to have somebody do those things for them. Now, the other parts of the definition of dementia include other ways that uh, the brain is affected that might not be, strictly speaking, cognitive function loss. That includes changes in personality and changes in behavior. We'll talk more about changes in behavior a, a little bit later. But some of the earliest symptoms that we see in people with dementia is a change in their personality. I'll relate this to, to our family's journey with my late wife in just a minute. And then a person living with dementia also has changes in sort of their emotional makeup. So how they express emotion, person with dementia has more difficulty through the journey expressing what they feel and also how they might respond to emotion when you emote to that person. And so, um, uh, and I'll talk, I'll refer more to that. So the diagnosis of dementia is a cognitive dementia uh, de uh, definition, a functional definition, and then all these sort of related functions uh, like personality, behavior, and emotion. And so because of all those things that happen, people living with dementia need a care partner which is the term I use for the person who's earlier in the journey, um, or they need a caregiver if they have difficulty with say their basic activities of daily living. So that's my transition to talk a little bit about sort of facts and figures related to caregiving. Um, and so we have nominally every person living with dementia has two or three caregivers. Now, it can be fewer, it can be more, but it's a team sport caregiving. So the statistics on caregiving, one in three caregivers are spouses, two in three caregivers are adult children, two out of three caregivers are women, and one in four are so-called sandwich generations. So especially for people diagnosed at a younger age, so-called early onset dementia, or onset before age 65, the sandwiches, they have children still living at home and they also have parents in the home that they're uh, caring for. So you've got 
three generations uh, in the family, which we heard an example of, of just a minute ago. So, um, so those are some of the basic statistics. Caregivers provide about 18 billion hours of unpaid care in a given year. That averages out to 100 hours a month. So do the math on that, 100 hours a month, 25 hours a week, that's you know more than a half-time job. And for many people, when caregiving is added on to their job of maybe taking care of children at home or trying to have a career at the same time, it becomes too much to squeeze in. And it's part of, of what causes caregiver stress and burden. Caregiving is a difficult task. So many of you or most of you who are here know that. 80% of people living with dementia require help with their basic activities of daily living. So getting in and out of bed or getting in and out of a chair, getting dressed, bathing or showering, eating, going to or from the toilet. About a third of people on average with dementia are incontinent. That number is much higher in the later stage. So the caregiving tasks are not easy. Um, and so the caregiving journey is not easy. So this is a picture of my family um, 11 years ago. So on the left, you see my late wife, Rebecca, and I. Uh, the three women in the middle are our adult daughters. And then uh, we have a son-in-law and grandson number one over on the left. We now have two grandsons and one more son-in-law. So the family has grown. But as you look at Rebecca, you would never know that she has middle stage dementia, that I had to help her get dressed that morning. I had to help her take a shower the night before. She needed help cutting up her food so she could eat properly. She had visual neglect. So this is often something not talked about as a caregiver. She couldn't see the left-hand side of her world. So for her to eat dinner, she would eat off the right-hand side of her plate and we'd flip her plate around and she'd eat off the other side of the plate. And you would never know that looking at her. So when she said to me one day, she's a master's trained speech pathologist, actually worked with people who had stroke and a traumatic brain injury to do their speech rehabilitation. She said to me one day, I can't remember what I'm reading. Nothing is sticking. And that was not normal for a 53-year-old, highly educated woman. No family history. She was the person who shouldn't have gotten Alzheimer's disease, but she did. And so she lived nine years from the, the time of her diagnosis. Um, and I had the privilege of being her caregiver with my three adult daughters over that journey. So um, the first book that I wrote is called Keeping Love Alive as Memories Fade, um, The Five Love Languages in the Alzheimer's Journey. And the book is basically about the emotional toil of caregiving and how it is in somebody who's got declining cognitive function, you can maintain emotional love bonds with that person and, uh, and maintain some relational intimacy. Um, and so, um, so the book is about how the five love languages, which are different ways that people connect with each other in a loving sort of way, how those five love languages can help you maintain that through the progression of early, middle, and late stage dementia. The book I'm going to talk about tonight is my second book, and it's called The Dementia Care Partners Workbook. And it's basically, um, it's, um, a guide for care partners, for caregivers, on everything they would experience from diagnosis all the way to the end of life. And it's organized around a framework called the eight central needs of dementia caregivers, care partners. And it was just based on the counseling center that I started and had wonderful colleagues that worked with me. And we spent about five years developing the framework the eight central need framework based on our experiences working with thousands of caregivers, hundreds of families who are on the journey. And that's the, the, um, the, the sort of summary of that book is what I'm gonna share over the next half hour or so. So the challenge of a talk like this is I'm gonna cover 
a lot of material, a lot of breadth, but not very much depth. And so somebody asked me earlier, the gentleman in the back, well, is, is the talk reflective of the book or vice versa? And it is. So if you want more depth, then um, definitely the book is available um, for you to, um, to buy and to dig into. And Caring Kind uses the book for the other purpose that I, I wrote it for, which is to be sort of a handbook for people participating in support groups. So thank you for that. So let's begin with, um, with the eight central needs. So central need number one is something that I've already done, which is I've shared a little bit about my story with you. Now, what I would love to be able to do is to spend enough time that I could understand why each of you came tonight. I would love to hear your stories. So why is telling and retelling the story important? So um, this, uh, Claire and I just got this in the mail. This is, do some of you get the AARP bulletin? So this is National Caregiver Month. And um, AARP did a survey of caregivers about some of the emotional burden of caregiving, not just dementia caregivers, but caregivers overall. And the number one emotion that came up on their survey experienced by 70% of care caregivers is isolation, loneliness. Oh, so many heads nodding right now, uh, affirming that. And so essentially the need to tell and retell your story, of course, you're telling it to someone. But I, I, I talk about this for sort of in two ways it's important. One is it takes the experience of me and it turns it into an experience of we. And that's very powerful. So whether you share it with a good friend who you're sitting with or a family member who cares about you uh, or in a support group or with a therapist, in whatever way you tell your story, that just the experience of telling it is healing in and of itself. The other way I say it is that you need to feel it to heal it. And the way you feel it is to talk about it. That's sort of the essence of what we do as counselors or therapists. Um, the need to retell the story is a need because dementia is a progressive neurodegenerative disease. In some ways, I say in the book, every day is the person's best day. Now, they may have a string or weeks of stability where they're having lots of good days, but over time, things are going to change and they're going to become worse. They're going to become more challenging. And when your loved one experience is a change that you're caring for, then your story changes and you need to retell that story. And so um, I have quotes in, in each of the chapters in the book. And the quote for this first chapter about telling your story is that your story will heal you and it will heal someone else. And this is really the, the fundamental principle of why we have support groups and why organizations like Caring Kind are so important. Because when you're in a group, the experience of sharing, not only do you benefit from what the group provides you individually, but you become one who becomes a teacher yourself, that your story, not only sharing it helps you, but it helps somebody else too. And there's tremendous power in sharing that story with others that you can help in that journey. So I've spent a lot of time talking about the first central need because it's the first one. And I think in some ways it's the most important one. Now, the second central need is the need to educate yourself. So the quote that goes along with this is, our strongest emotion is fear, especially fear of the unknown. So in the book, we talk a lot about the brain. The brain is the most complex organ in the human body, it weighs only three pounds, about the size of two grapefruits smushed together, but it controls everything you think, everything you feel, everything you say, and everything you do. It all comes from the noodle up here. And so 
most of us have not spent our, our life studying the human brain. So learning about it helps you understand why the person that you're caring for either does the things that they do or isn't able to do the things that they do. So understanding the brain, educating yourself about the brain is really, really important. And the other reason I mentioned, because dementia progresses, it changes over time. And so um, understanding what the journey looks like is very helpful in, in sort of two general ways. So one is we describe in the book the different characteristics of MCI, like the pre-Alzheimer's stage, and then early, middle, and late stage. And you can, you know, uh, re you can remember or refer back to all of those things, and then you know what's ahead. So as I mentioned, we've counseled in our program at Wake Forest, counseled you know, hundreds of families, thousands of care partners. One of the most common questions we get in therapy is, what's next? I just want to know what's next. And so by having, by knowing what's next, it takes some of the, the power, the fear away from when you actually experience it because you knew it was coming. Um, the other thing is that you can learn things um, about the brain and about behavior that may help you. So you can't really write in any book every experience that you'll encounter as a caregiver. But you can write common experiences that are shared among caregivers, and that can help equip you with how to deal things like some of the behavioral changes that we'll talk about. So education is really uh, one of the key um, central needs. I think one of the biggest challenges that care partners have is the, the need to adapt to changing relationships. So as the person living with dementia, their cognitive skills change, their emotional expression changes, um, they may have some personality changes and some new behaviors that you hadn't seen or expected before. There's a natural consequence of all that on your relationship with that person. And so I'm gonna spend a little bit more time talking about this central need because this, these changes in behavior are often what um, care partners struggle with the most, how to deal with changes in behavior. And honestly, it's what we as medical and mental health professionals also struggle with is how to advise care partners on how to deal with these things. So this slide could be like a whole hour talk tonight. So we're not gonna, we're not gonna do that. Um, but these are some of the challenging uh, behaviors that occur in people living with like early to maybe early to mid-stage dementia. Apathy, lack of insight. I mentioned changes in emotional expression, changes in mood, repetitive questioning, lost identity, no longer knowing the people who are caring uh, for them. Delusion. So a delusion is when you believe something to be true that's not true. And delusions are common in people with, with dementia. And then just behavioral changes, kind of taking the brakes off behavior, what we call behavioral disinhibition. The person expresses themselves in ways that they wouldn't have before they had their neurocognitive disorder, their dementia. So these are some common challenging behaviors. So in later stage dementia, there's a different set of challenging behaviors. So to introduce those to you, I'm gonna tell you a story. So I'm gonna continue telling the story of, of Rebecca's journey. So um, this happened uh, almost exactly 10 years ago. Um, it was the summer after the picture I showed you earlier. And um, I care for Rebecca at home for her journey. And every morning we had a routine of going on our back porch and having coffee together. So I was serving her coffee. And if, if you notice her hair, she doesn't have any gray hair. She had blonde hair, even at 50 something, she didn't have any gray hair. And the way our porch was oriented, the sun was shining in her hair. And so the night before at dinner, we talked about the kids and we talked about us. And, you know, we did kind of our, our typical evening routine. 
So on this morning, I served her coffee. I looked at her as I was pouring her coffee and I said, well, sweetie, your hair looks beautiful this morning. The sun is shining through it. And she looked up at me, she had this blank look on her face. And she said, I have no idea who you are. And I don't know what happened that night, the night before, but she no longer knew me as her husband. We had been together for over 30 years at that point. She didn't know our three daughters as her children. As best we can tell, she lost a chunk that went back to where she grew up in Cedar Rapids, Iowa in middle school. She didn't remember she was married. She didn't remember she was a speech therapist. She, it just, it was gone. Like, and it's a scary story. And what, what happened in the caregiving journey was a whole new set of behaviors that are typical. And this was really kind of the beginning of the latter part of her journey. She became agitated. She became aggressive. She was paranoid. She would say, I want to go home. She would walk out the front door because she was looking for Cedar Rapids. We live in North Carolina. So she would start wandering from the home. She would resist care. She became depressed. She had episodes of terrible depression. And she started to have what we call sundowning, just late afternoon, evening challenges. And, you know, as I share that story, I could see even Olivia sitting up front, I could see tears in her eyes. Because you think about that from my perspective as her husband and her caregiver. So I want you to do a complete shift. I want you to think about what that was like for Rebecca. Because all of a sudden, there is now a strange man in the house taking care of her who wants her to take her clothes off and go in the shower. And he wants to help her get out of her jammies and get into her clothes at the beginning of the day. And um, so for any of us, you know, we wouldn't want a stranger to see us without her clothes on. And then think about her surroundings. She didn't recognize our home as her home anymore. She lived in a strange place. So of course she wanted to leave because if I were to lock you in a room in a strange place, what would you want to do? You'd want to leave the room. And so um, all of a sudden she had what we call in the profession attachment losses. She didn't know her peeps anymore. She didn't know her surroundings anymore. And when people living with dementia experience attachment loss, it drives a lot of what we call these challenging, I call them challenging behavioral expressions that are really, they're normal behaviors, but they're just occurring in a context for a person who's struggling with not knowing their people and their surroundings. So, um, so the consequence of all of these behavioral changes and challenges is that the relationship changes. And what you have to do is adapt to those as a care partner and that's part of what we teach is what are the strategies I can use, like the love languages, for instance, that I can adapt to this changing relationship. And the quote with this central need is, even though their behaviors have changed, the person you know is still in there. The fourth central need is the need to grieve your losses. And so I say that um, the most difficult kind of grief journey a person can have, maybe even more difficult than the grief associated with losing someone through death, is the grief of a care partner, somebody living with dementia. So I'm sorry, I can see this. This is weighty, isn't it? There's, there's a lot of things to put in, in the backpack. So I, I'm sorry you're feeling that weight. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about grief. So my training is actually as a grief counselor. So in grief counseling, we use the terms grieving and mourning as two separate words. We commonly kind of use them interchangeably when we talk about grief, but they actually they have different meanings. Grief is the feelings you have on the inside when you experience loss. 
mourning is the outward expression of grief, sometimes grief gone public. So the need to tell and retell your story is actually um, a therapeutic grief experience because you're externalizing your inner grief in an act of mourning, which is telling your story. And this is the most important thing that we do in individual therapy, couples therapy, family therapy, and our support groups is we give people time to talk about the experience. Sometimes I use the term to decompress because there's always something new to talk about or you view similar circumstances in really different ways. Now, with cancer or with dementia, there's the experience of anticipatory grief, right? You think, well, what's the future going to be like? Um, uh, and, uh, and so that's anticipatory grief. What are they going to be like if they don't know who I am anymore? And how am I going to manage that? There's also something called ambiguous loss on the, the dementia uh, grief journey. Because I could go back to that picture of Rebecca standing next to me. She looks perfectly fine. So we're out at the grocery store, right? And she's got all these care needs. Walk by somebody we know, casual, hi. Say, oh, Rebecca, you look great. You know, sh Rebecca passed away three years after that picture you saw from her Alzheimer's disease. And so it's very ambiguous, right? Because they look fine, but inside they have this this brain disease, and it makes it ambiguous for you as the care partner, right? So it'd be different if they had a visible sign of their disease, because then people would understand for them and for you as their care partner. But because the person, they look pretty, pretty much the same until, oh, middle of the middle stage or late middle stage, then there's often sort of a look that you see in people living with dementia. And lastly, uh, there's some aspect of disenfranchised loss. So disenfranchised loss is the kind of loss that occurs when there's some stigma associated with the disease. So we were talking about this before the talk tonight, that is there a stigma associated with having dementia or Alzheimer's disease? In the United States, I think the answer is yes. In other countries in the world, like in England or in Australia, um, not so much. They do a better job really of integrating seniors into society and destigmatizing seniors, you know, as part of the family unit and the family system than we do in the United States. So here when you have the cognitive, you know, normal cognitive changes of aging, then there's some stigma. And that becomes a disenfranchised loss, like your loss experience because of that stigma becomes less important maybe than a loss experience of something that doesn't have the stigma. The other way to think about caregiver grief, grief or loss, uh, grief and loss is to think about the kinds of losses that are unique to the caregiving experience. So I categorize these in sort of three things. There are personal losses, there are relationship losses, and then this idea of the loss of peace of mind. So let me just briefly talk about each of those. So personal losses, I mentioned the average caregiver spends 25 hours a week for some care partners. It's gonna be way more than 24 hours a week. So that comes at the cost of personal time and freedom. Uh, if you're taking care of a loved one, you don't have time to take care of even your own basic health needs or maybe occupation. So I read a study several years ago that the average income of a caregiver for a loved one with dementia, if they were still working, their average income decreased like somewhere between $25,000, $30,000 a year because they had a conflict of time. They couldn't commit as much time to their job. They may have had to change jobs or reduce their hours. And then of course, just the personal loss of social activities and recreation, both yourself and with your family. The relationship losses, I think, are the most difficult, especially what I call the loss of the twosome. So as a couple, as two people in partnership, you have your individual identities in the relationship, 
but you also have a, an identity as a couple. So when one person is affected by dementia, not only do you have the losses that go with their changes as an individual, the roles and responsibilities they had in the relationship, but you have a loss of that twosomeness, that couple identity. You don't relate to each other in the same way. And so that sort of leads into the second thing. There's a loss of intimacy. And I don't just mean sexual intimacy, which does happen for many couples affected by dementia, but a loss of relational intimacy. You know, those things that you sort of share together, which could be just in an expression between the two of you or the things you may have talked about at nighttime before you went to bed or whatever. It's, it's just that loss of intimacy. And, um, and then, you know, when you're diagnosed with a disease that has a time frame on it, eight to 10 years, it's the loss of the future together, like this old couple, you know, growing old together. So I have to tell you, whenever I see two older people walking together like that, it generates tremendous sadness, you know, because my frame of reference for that is, well, I'm not growing old with Rebecca. And so it isn't that I'm not happy for that couple, but you know, it's just, it's the frame of reference. And these relationship losses, I think are some of the most difficult that we deal with um, as care partners and also in people walking with others on the journey. And last but not least is the loss of peace of mind, kind of the constant worry, um, the sleeping with one eye open because you can't really fully relax when you know they're next to you or in the room next to you, or even if they're, they're elsewhere, if they're in residential care. By the way, to me, the F word in dementia care is facility. I never say that word. I call that the F word of of dementia care services. It's residential care because uh, of the second sort of thing is, well, I promised him or I promised her I would never put him in a place, right? But the issue is not whether you're a good husband or a good wife or a good son or a good daughter. It's why I use the term residential care. Where is the best place for that person to live to get the, the best care that they need? And so there are different reasons that you make that decision. And we could spend an hour talking about those reasons. And so uh, it's not about you, it's about them and what they need. But there is a loss of peace of mind that goes with that. So the grief journey is really a difficult one on the, uh, as a dementia care partner. Um, and um, it's one that, why I've spent a little bit extra uh, time talking about tonight. And the quote is, one of the hardest things you'll ever have to do is to grieve the loss of somebody who's still alive, who's still with you. So let's go on to the, the next two central needs. So central need five is the need to take care of yourself. And I have a little, it's called an emotions cloud. You can Google emotion cloud and you get all kinds of these. And people who, um, who are care partners for a loved one with dementia do a notoriously terrible job of taking care of themselves because you have this paradox present. So I talk about the paradoxes that occur as a caregiver. A paradox is when two things are true that can't be true together. So the, care, the paradox of, of self-care is I need to spend more time on me as caregiver. I need a break. I need some time away. But then the other statement, is, but I need to spend more time with my husband or my wife or my partner or my mom or my dad. In other words, I need to spend more time with them and I need to spend more time on me. And, you know, time is a limited commodity. It's a finite commodity. So those things cannot be true together. And yet they are. And there are so many paradoxes that occur on the caregiving journey. So what, what I would say about the need for self-care is you have to do it and you have to be intentional about it. So it is likely that 
your loved one with dementia does not have the same framework of time that you do. And so when you're away from them, that they will be aware that you're away from them. But whether you're away for five minutes or an hour or two days or a week probably is not going to completely register, especially in the middle or late part of the journey. And so they'll be glad to see you when you come back. Um, you have the concept of time because you need the long weekend away uh, or you need the afternoon off, but not so much for them. And so you have to be intentional about self-care um, because you will otherwise you'll burn out. So I say in the book that dementia caregiving is a marathon, not a sprint. And it's a team sport, not an individual event. And so that leads into, oh, and so uh, I love this quote by a woman named Anne Lamott. Almost everything will work again if you unplug it for a few minutes, including you. <laughs> so unplug yourself. <laughs> oh, yes, it's, it's in the book too. And, and I'm glad you made me back up because there was another thing I wanted to say is one of the things we do in our support groups, one of our weekly exercises is called the emotions exercise. So there, you can see there's a whole bunch of emotions that are listed there. So we give people this worksheet and it has 60 emotions listed on it. And the exercise is circle the one emotion that describes where you're at right now in your caregiving journey. And so um, we have tallied these results over time. And the emotion that people mention the most, I don't know if I have a pointer, um, sorry, I'll get right back in my frame, is guilt. It's the most common emotion that dementia care partners experience is guilt. So let me introduce you to an invisible little friend that sits on my shoulder from my caregiving journey. Um, uh, their name is the guilt gremlin. I'm not even gonna give a gender to the guilt gremlin. <laughs> so the guilt gremlin and the guilt gremlin says things like, oh, you need to spend more time with him or with her. You're not spending enough time. Uh, and then the guilt gremlin over here says, well, you need to be, you need to take some time off. You haven't had a afternoon off in three weeks. And so then you take the afternoon off and the guilt gremlin says, what are you, what are you doing going to this movie? You should be back with him or, you know, guilt is such a complex emotion, but it's the emotion. So you're nodding your head, <laughs> you feel it. It's the emotion that care partners feel the most. And it's really hard to deal with because you know who your greatest critic is, right? It's the three of us, right? Me, myself, and I. And um, so thank you for pulling me back. I almost forgot to mention that. So the, the sixth need kind of evolves out of the fifth need, but it's the need to ask for and accept help from others. So again, it's the idea of being a team sport. You can't do it by yourself. So when I think about dementia along a timeline from diagnosis, mild cognitive impairment to early stage, middle stage and late stage dementia. Each part of that journey has different challenges associated with it. I call them the pressure points on the journey. So in early stage dementia, the person living with dementia usually is able to do many of their sort of complicated activities of daily living, but they might need some help. So like driving, managing finances, taking medications, cooking, um, shopping, grocery shopping, uh, driving, you know, things that they're doing, but maybe beginning to have more challenges. So, uh, so they're the challenges. Yeah, that sure. yeah. Really stay. Yeah. 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 Oh, some, somebody's not muted out there, <laughs> out there in zoom land. Um, and then, um, and then in the middle stage, the person becomes depend more dependent in those complicated activities of daily living. 
they're not driving anymore. You're helping with, you know, things like, um, you know, managing the finances, meal preparation and so on. But they're starting to have some difficulty getting dressed, maybe cutting their food up or toilet hygiene or bathing or showering hygiene. Um, and so that brings a different set of challenges. And then um, the things that I've listed here that I described in Rebecca when she, she lost recognition of the kids in me, the agitation and aggression, hallucinations and wandering, sundowning and incontinence. What I sort of tongue in cheek say is the need to figure out who's gonna be the rear admiral, right? When the person is incontinent, um, but that's a big decision. And those are the things that often will bring people to the brink of saying, you know, can I do this? Can I do this at home anymore? So it's interesting. Each of my kids was home for a different part of their mom's journey. But there was one deal breaker among all three of them, which was they did not want to do the incontinence care. They said, Dad, we're just, we're not going to do that for mom. It's a dignity issue for us. It's especially a dignity issue for her. And that's when we brought paid caregivers into the home to help with that. So you have to, as intentional as you have to be with self-care, you have to be intentional about asking for help. We had 17 people that helped in different capacities during Rebecca's illness. It may have been my brother and sister-in-law coming once every three months for a visit and having a good chat. It may have been my buddy, next door who would come over and mow the lawn. What, whatever it was, there were things that I just I didn't have the time to do because my focus was on caring for Rebecca. But you have to be intentional about asking for help. And you know what? We're not good at self-care and we're not good at asking for help. So I remember when Rebecca was first diagnosed her doctor said, you know, the two of you are so used to helping others by your chosen professions, and um, but that's all changing now. Now you have to be the ones who receive help, but that's really hard for us to do. So be smart enough to know when you need help and brave enough to ask for it. The next central need is the need to prepare for what's ahead. So we, again, we could spend a lot of time talking about, about each of these, but because the nature of the Alzheimer's journey and really the other forms of dementia for the most part, it's a years long journey, um, different than you know being diagnosed with maybe metastatic cancer where it might be a months long journey. So there is time to prepare for what's ahead. And the sort of issues include legal issues like power of attorney, healthcare power of attorney, their financial issues, like how do we pay for this $65,000 a year disease? And if we don't have enough money, you know, in most states, the Medicaid look back period is five years. So you have the opportunity, if you take the initiative early on, you can transfer assets to your children that if you anticipate needing Medicaid, you then can still pass along your assets, but not have that be part of the, the Medicaid uh, looking back. So you can plan financially. And then the most neglected part of preparation is planning for the end of life issues. So I'll, I'll tell you another story with Rebecca. So we, we went for a second and a third opinion because our doctor at Wake Forest said, you know, she's 53, no family history. She shouldn't get dementia. You better get another opinion. So we went and we got another opinion, went to Mayo Clinic and we were driving to the airport as we left and we pulled over and we talked about it. And we talked about, she said to me, you know, I know I'm going to die from this disease. The doctor had told us that. I just want you to promise me a couple things that you'll take care of me till the end. That was an easy promise. And when I can't eat or drink or swallow, I don't want 
any tubes. I don't want any shocking. Well, that day didn't come for almost nine years after that discussion. But I can tell you for the girls and I to know that those were Rebecca's wishes, that, you know, when that finally happened, when the end came, that we knew what she wanted because it's those are hard decisions and to not have to make them in crisis and to make them with the person especially that's a gift and a blessing that you can have even the decision about uh, residential care so i've said to my daughters i said look if i need to go into residential care so be it if that's the best place for me to be and that's best for sort of our family, then then that's fine. I'm okay if you do that. Those kind of discussions are so meaningful. So uh, I love this quote, dates on the calendar are closer than they appear. So many families, and I have to say, the majority of families put off these critical discussions until they're in crisis. And you have to make a decision in the moment when you're maybe not thinking your best. The, so the last of the central needs is the need to explore existential and spiritual issues to find meaning. Um, and so um, it's very common to ask, so to recognize that bad things happen to good people all the time and people have spiritual questions. I love that it's part of the mission statement of this lectureship is in the art of science that it includes addressing spiritual issues because people say why me or you might say of your loved one why him or why her um you might ask of god if you believe in god well you know god how could you allow this or if you believe in god well i thought god was powerful and so how did God allow this to happen to, to him or to her? Or I thought God was good, but this is not good. So then you question the character of God. And I think we just don't, we don't make space for those kinds of questions. Now, most of the questions of an existential or spiritual nature don't have a specific answer, but just being able to ask the question and explore your thoughts about that is very healing in and of itself. And that's how it got on the list of the eight central needs. So um, I want to introduce my wife, Claire. There she is back there. Um, so Claire lost her husband, Jim, from Alzheimer's disease a few weeks after um, after Rebecca died. And, uh, and so we uh, met. And we started dating at 60 something. And then she asked me to marry her. <laughs> and what was I gonna say, you know? <laughs> um, so um, so we, we lost um, our spouses seven and a half going on eight years ago, but we, we've been married for five years and she, um, she manages the book table. So there are books out there. I'm glad to autograph the books. We offer them at a discount. Um, an autograph book is increases the value from 1995 to $20. <laughs> but, um, and she can answer questions that you might have. So I think we're gonna stop now and we're gonna take some questions. So, well, I, Stephanie, so how, how are we gonna manage the question? Real quick here. Sure. Okay. All right. We've had a number that have come in already. Did we switch the cameras? Are we where we need to be? Awesome. So a number of, I have got, a, I have a whole list of my own questions, uh, which I'll try to keep so I can get to yours. Um, and actually a few of them were already, you know, coming in. So 
So I have like duplicates of things, but um, let me start with this one. I know that in the second, uh, the lesson two, uh, the quote by H.P. Lovecraft, the oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear. And the oldest and strongest fear is the fear of the unknown. And then you go on to talk about um, kind of the symptoms and, and different um, abilities that people mm -hmm. have um, in the various dementias. And I'm wondering, kind of based on your personal experience and the lessons that you've learned through your counseling, what are some ways that care partners can prepare emotionally for the unknown that arises, you know, kind of on a day-to-day -day experience? And you can look at them. You don't have to look at me. Okay. okay. <laughs> so I, I think... Um, maybe two answers to that question. So, you know, I, I mentioned in the central need too is the need to educate yourself. I think there is tremendous value in kind of knowing what's coming next. And, um, and so, for instance, by knowing there's the possibility that my loved one may not know me anymore as their husband or their wife or their son or their daughter, knowing that that could happen helps you emotionally prepare for it in the moment. So the flip side of that is that when that happens, it's, it's extremely emotionally distressing. I'll say that when, see, we don't have these noises in Winston-Salem, <laughs> North Carolina. <laughs> We, we might have the crickets chirping or <laughs> no one else even hears it. Right. <laughs> okay. That's so, that's so funny. Last night, Claire and I were saying, how does anyone sleep around here with all this noise? Um, but uh, I'll say that the when Rebecca said to me, I, I don't know who you are. That was the worst moment in the nine year journey. It was even worse than when she physically left this earth. Because to for her to not know me, you know, that was the loss of twosome that I that I referred to. So I think in some ways you can prepare, but you can't prepare mm -hmm. for the um the the emotionality of it. And so that's where having someone that you can tell or retell the story to, connecting with your family member or your friend or um, your group or your counselor or therapist, that being able to share that experience is so critical. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the telling your, the telling your story. The telling and retelling. It's why in some ways all the central needs kind of point back to that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if 10 years ago, Ed Shaw caregiver, walked into the office of Dr. Ed Shaw therapist. What advice or thoughts would you have given yourself back then? Yeah, so that's that's a good question. Um, so the the situation, our family's journey was a journey with early onset Alzheimer's disease. So I was in the thick of my career. We had one our youngest daughter was still at home in high school. The others were in college. And, um, and so my response to that as caregiver was to try and take care of Rebecca, um, but also to take care of my daughters. And so it became the, the burden of caring for the four of them, but they were competent young women and several years after Rebecca's diagnosis, their mom's diagnosis, they once cornered me. They made me sit down and they said, dad, you're burning yourself out. You're trying to do too much. You're trying to do it all yourself. You're trying to take care of mom. You're trying to take care of us. You can't do it all. Like something's going to break. And they said it's something to me. They, they, they <laughs> give you an intervention. It's an intervention. And they said something to me and I've repeated this. It just, it just popped into my head. They said, we can't become orphans. If something happens to you, where are we? And so in that moment, they became, instead of, you know, my adult children, 
we became partners on the caregiving journey. And now the advice I would give myself is to, you know, and, and this is something we do in our counseling center. So we schedule family meetings with every family when we intake a, a new family who has a loved one on the journey. And that is we identify, you know, the family system and who, what are the roles and responsibilities of each person in this, in the system and, and sort of how are you going to divide and conquer? It helps people become a team right from the beginning instead of being forced into the team concept because you've crumbled individually, mm. can't do it. Mm. So that's, that's your that, help and asking and receiving help as well. Is asking and receiving help. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, two questions came in around the, at least two, if not more, um, around this idea of the, your guilt gremlin. Um, how can I silence the guilt gremlin so I can grieve my losses and take care of myself? Or how do I cope with the guilt I feel for getting angry about my situation? Yes. So I think the guilt gremlin is a difficult gremlin to, to deal with from a, a counseling or, or therapeutic perspective. Um, guilt is, it's a common reason that brings people in for therapy and it's also a really challenging sort of emotion to deal with. So often um, in exploring why the person feels guilty, um, you often will find there are some, um, the, the counseling term is irrational beliefs, but people believe things about their own abilities, their capabilities, or what their caregiving roles and responsibilities should be uh, that are that are not rational and reasonable. Mm -hmm. And so exploring those things in therapy is a process. It's not an event, you know. And so by kind of dissecting out, well, what are you feeling guilty about? And then let's look at that. So you're feeling guilty because you don't spend more time with your mom because you're, you know, her adult son and you know you're you're supposed to be spending time taking care of mom but then you have your own wife and kids. And so, well, so you explore the idea. Well, I mean, how many hours do you really have in a day? And do you really have more time? And so if you're sort of kicking yourself about not spending more time, but then you objectively look at how much time there is, you know, then the irrational belief becomes a bit more of a rational belief. Mm -hmm. So that would be an example. I think it kind of depends on the nature of the guilt and how you you explore that. Mm -hmm. But that's that's an example for that question. I, th I think it's it's an issue where sometimes, you know, be, or being able to address that in a support group, you know, so often if, if I were in a support group and somebody said, I'm feeling guilty and I can't kick it, mm -hmm. you know, it's just kicking me, I would turn to the wisdom of the group and say, well, how? How have how have all of you? I would I would maybe turn to you because you were nodding your head. Well, what's your experience been? You know, how is it that you're feeling that guilt? And then you know you have the power of the group to kind of work through that together. The we, the we, the, the right. right. It it becomes a we instead of a me. Mm -hmm. Couple on. Um... Patients. Um, I guess uh, this is good. My mother's in memory care. Most of the times that I go to see her, I'm reminded of just how confused and cognitively impaired she is, and my heart breaks a little. Do you have any recommended coping strategies? Yeah, well, it's it's a really good question. It's a heartbreaking experience mm -hmm. to go. Um, I had a similar question. I was counseling um, a clergy person and he would say, you know, I go to these visits to like memory care uh, places and and I just, um, I dread going mm -hmm. because the person is very, they're, they're not very interactive. You know, I feel like there's nothing I can do. I get there and I'm looking at my watch 
saying, oh, I need to spend 15 minutes here, but like after two minutes, I'm wanting to go. It's really hard. But um, I think sometimes that's uh, that focus is kind of on your experience, you know, and and how you're feeling. And, and that's that's important to address your own feelings. But when you go and visit, you know, whoever it is, your loved one, your spouse or your parent, you know, that's an act of giving. And so the, the cognitive kind of reframing is that I'm going to go and I'm going to spend a half hour with her today and maybe I'll sing, maybe, you know, I'll, I kind of cycle through the love languages. Is this you know? what I was just going to say? <laughs> I can hear some love languages, yeah. strategies coming up here. Why don't you go ahead and elaborate on those a little? Yeah, so maybe I'm going to spend quality time or I'm going to share, you know, and I love you some words of affirmation or I might bring a gift, a cookie or a chocolate or something. I might do an act of service, which is, maybe she like a back rub today, you know, mm -hmm. or just, you know, a little kind of gentle squeeze of support in their arm or shoulder. If, you know, like in the case of a clergy person where a back rub wouldn't be appropriate, but you can just think about, well, how can I give? Because caregiving is the ultimate act of sacrifice. So we say in the, the second chapter of the Keeping Love Alive book, we, we refer to this Hebrew word called chesed. And chesed is a word, is about sacrificial love. It's love about the security of faithfulness, not necessarily about the thrill of romance. Mm -hmm. And that's what, what you're doing is you're going with an attitude of, I'm going to give, you know, I'm going to sacrifice because, you know, we've been it's my mom or my dad or it's my wife, you know, my husband, because because we, we do it together. It's why people go every day and help, you know, feed their loved one mm -hmm. because it's an act of, of chesed. I think the um, the love languages are very helpful in those situations. And I think also something you said earlier about the concept of time, that that is something that changes with people. Yep. And so our understanding of oh is this visit long enough or is it too short it's more about the meaning of the yes. visit and and being able to kind of think through those love languages in very practical ways to find a meaningful interaction with someone is is a yeah. possibility yes hmm. that's one of the guide bits that i was talking about at the beginning that that i think that ed offers um i feel like i'm losing my patience all the time how can I become more patient? Yeah. So impatience is, is the number one caregiving challenge. It's the one that we in our counseling center by far and away is the, the one that we help people with the most. So um, patience, you know, from a therapy perspective is a cognitive behavioral therapy, is a cognitive behavioral skill. So let's use the example um, when I, I do my, my trainings on uh, dealing with challenging behavioral expressions. This is the first example. So I give the example of a couple, the woman has sort of middle stage Alzheimer's disease and her husband says to her, we're gonna go out to dinner at six o'clock tonight. And a minute later she says, are we going out to dinner tonight? And he says, yes, we're going out to dinner at six o'clock tonight. And a minute later, you know, and it goes on and on. And finally, about the fifth or sixth time, he screams at her and he says, we're going out at six o'clock, like I told you, right? And then, right? And so who feels terrible? We're not going out anymore. <laughs> we were going out, but. Right, right. If he wants to punish her, he's like, well, you're on your own. I'm going out. But, um, but so, so that's the example around, we, we talk about patients, but you know, so Alzheimer's disease, first and foremost, is a memory disorder. Mm -hmm. And so we teach this sort of basic principle. It's not that the person won't remember. It's not that, you know, I'm looking at you and saying, I'm going to do whatever I can to irritate the H-E double toothpicks out of you. <laughs> you know, it's that the person can't remember. They literally, that part of their brain, think of the shriveled up brain that part of their brain called the hippocampus, it's gone. 
It's an empty fluid filled space. They have no capacity for memory. So we teach caregivers that skill. It's, it's the general principle of it's not that they won't, they can't. Mm -hmm. And so we'll say, okay, like think of, um, uh, think in your mind, I'm going to be patient, say, just pick a number. For, I'm going to let them ask the same question 10 times before I even start to feel a little revved up inside. And then we say the 11th time, instead of getting mad, just say, honey, I'm going to go in the kitchen and get some coffee. Just remove yourself from the situation and decompress a little bit. Um, and so, but you have to then capture the experience of the 10th question in 10 minutes you have to capture it up here. That's the cognitive part and say, oh, it's not that they won't, they can't. And then it's the behavioral part. I'm gonna react calmly, patiently. And, um, and over time, you may not do it right the first time or the second time or the 10th time, but as you get practiced doing it, it will become an integrated sort of skill. So um, patience does take training, it's hard. Mm -hmm. You know, but the thing is that even if you do it wrong, it's like parenting, you know, none of us are or were perfect parents, you know, but, but on the whole, right, we got better as we got older, hopefully, and, you know, our kids were forgiving and our loved ones are both forgetting and forgiving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we're in a, a kind of a new area, a new era now with people being diagnosed earlier and there's a real push for that. And we have you know, disease modifying treatments now that are hopefully only going to improve and keep people in an earlier stage. Um, thoughts on kind of the parallels of the eight central needs for people living with dementia and other kind of meaningful activities that you recommend for people who are in those early, in those early stages. Yes. Yeah, so, um... I think there's a tendency when someone has a diagnosis of um, either mild cognitive impairment or early stage Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia, uh, there's the notion that, well, I need to keep them cognitively engaged like 24 seven, mm -hmm. need to keep their brain active all the time. Well, that would be exhausting for any of us who are cognitively normal, you know, <laughs> our part. Um, and so I, I think that you have to, you have to adapt to where they're at in the journey um, and, you know, what their own tolerance is for, for things like cognitive engagement, but then respect that they have a neurodegenerative disease and there is a driving need for more sleep mm -hmm. because your brain has to work harder for a given activity. Um, and then I mentioned that on that list of behavioral changes in early to middle stage, the first one was apathy. Apathy is just motivation, get up and go drive. And people, one of the first symptoms of dementia is often apathy. Mm -hmm. You know, gosh, you know, mom or dad, they just, they always were doing stuff and now, they're pretty content to just like be a couch potato. And, you know, I don't understand it. So once you've ruled out the medical causes of apathy, then you, you have to figure out how to navigate apathy and to try and balance the need to have some cognitive engagement. Mm -hmm. So I say, you know, see how long they'll stay engaged. It might be five minutes. It might be 20 minutes. Um, and then they don't need to be engaged the whole day. But, you know, think of in a day, two, three, four activities, whatever sort of fits in the day and fits with them. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, what kind and, of and then, in, mm -hmm. so what kind of activities? Yeah. So um, there, there, there isn't a right or wrong activity. So there's actually research studies of people transitioning from normal cognitive aging to MCI or early stage dementia. And does it matter what the cognitive activity is to keep you from, you know, progressing beyond normal cognitive aging? And the answer is it doesn't. So if you like word puzzles, do word puzzles. You like Sudoku. If you like math, do Sudoku. Um, and then it can be, so social activities are important too. 
So it could be if the person likes to read, uh, go to an art museum, go to a movie, you know, find an activity. There's no magic about any one. It's just spending some time doing those things. If you can match something that's cognitively stimulating with something that's socially engaging, that's a great kind of twofer. So um, in the, the Keeping Love Alive book, we have charts of activities that, that you can do in different stages of the, the disease that are kind of oriented along the lines of the five love languages. But there must be, you know, 40 or 50 activities that we mention. It just depends what the person likes to do and what they're able to do. So I have to jump in because we have a number of different, <laughs> I'm seeing, you know, the staff saying like, say something, say something. So we've got a number of early stage kind of programs and activities that we're here, that we do here at Caring Kind. And we're, you know, a number of us would be happy to talk more specifically about those. You actually didn't really talk at all though about, um, we, you know, Ed has the compliment to the care partners workbook and that that's actually kind of a 10 session support group um that that we actually do here at caring kind and so we have open slots in that if you if you're interested in joining that going through this with a group of people you're welcome to do that virtually or in person and we have the complement to that for people who are in the early stages so that's our journeying together program and our partnering together program and i think you know i'm really struck by the the need to tell your story and i think what we find in those the groups of people who are actually living with alzheimer's or another form of dementia for them to be able they may not come in necessarily ready to tell that story and what we find is they often get engaged in something else some other activity cognitive stimulation therapy or another program that we're doing and meeting their peers, and then given the opportunity to share their experiences, then their story comes out. Mm -hmm. And it's really a transformational experience. And um, we could introduce you to a number of those folks who could talk about the power of being able to be yeah. to tell their story and to be had to have their story heard. You mean the person going through it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the person who's mm -hmm. living with them. And actually, if you go to our website, you can see. Um, We've got two uh, events that we did here live called mm -hmm. To Whom I May Concern, which are readers theater types of experiences where a group of people living with dementia met together. They worked with facilitators and Kenny was in here earlier. She was one of the facilitators. Um, they crafted their stories into a script and then read those stories in a public setting like this, right. yeah. you know, here, right, right. yeah, right. so. Um, you know what you didn't mention is physical activity, walking, walking hand in hand, which started big time in the in the pandemic. I find that my husband, if he doesn't walk mm. every day, he loses ground. Mm -hmm. It's it's really visible. Mm. So yes, taking a walk is. Do you want to just repeat that? So yeah. yeah, so um, tell me your name. Karen. So Karen was saying that um, physical activity is really uh, important and helpful for her husband who's who's living with dementia. And yes, so physical activity, thank you for mentioning that, is... We both, it's such a great way to feel connected. People love that we walk hand in hand. They always admire the two of us doing it. It makes your heart swell. Mm. It's yeah, a good thing. it is a good thing. Thanks. Nice. Yes. Is this your question? Yeah. This is your question here. Do you want to just ask your question? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm struggling to read it. Yeah. Uh, this is really wonderful and very meaningful. Thank you. I guess I'm thinking about people who are maybe for various life circumstances and reasons without a large support system. Uh, we, you know, we're very interested in, in helping people who might live alone or who might just have a smaller support system, perhaps with one care partner or even without others. We're familiar with the share the care model, but could you elaborate on someone who maybe isn't part of the faith-based community, doesn't really naturally find um, a large family and whatnot? Yes. So um, the, the question was about what about people who don't have, you know, friend and family kind of resources, what do they do? So it's interesting, we did not do Zoom-based counseling or support groups at the Wake Forest Memory Counseling Program pre-COVID, but we moved pretty quickly into that model. So our hospital was really conservative. 
about allowing people in and probably was pretty much shut down for two years. So in a very short time, we moved to an online format for individual counseling, couple and family counseling, as well as for all of our support groups. But that was a that was a good change. So now we offer Zoom-based support groups and some of the you know, some of the different nonprofits that work in the, the um, dementia space, Alzheimer's space, uh, they have resources like um, uh, caregiver support groups that you can participate in. There are 24 seven hotlines where you can call in or daytime hotlines where you can call in and get a trained professional, a social worker on the line who understands the, the disease and the journey and get your questions answered. So I think, people are are never really alone and then you know they can also if there are programs that come into the home to support caregivers those sorts of programs if they exist mm -hmm. can really be meaningful so i think as social isolation has become increasingly kind of on the radar of the you know the damaging health effects of social isolation that we're seeing more and more groups, friendly visitor types of groups, circle of care types of groups that are trying to address that. I think um, also a good resource is this program called Share the Care, which you can actually look up online. It's it's really about kind of a way of how do you actually build a team of care. Um, lots of resources there, and I'm happy to talk to anybody else about it. Um, and again, I just want to offer, you know, our services out there that, that we're here and available. And, and I'm conscious of the time. So I'm, I'm going to kind of give you a kind of one more question to wrap it up. And then we're happy to, you know, stay on here. There are a number of our staff that are in the room. If you could just, if you're from Caring Kind, just raise your hand here. Thanks. So feel free to kind of corner any one of us. Ed, thank you so much. You've given us a wealth of information both professionally and personally. Um, and I always try to think of like, what are some best next steps for all of those who are in the room and in the Zoom room? So we've got a combination of family members as well as professionals that are typically here. And I would guess that that's true in this audience. And so I'm wondering what's one thing that a professional could do tomorrow or the next time that they're interacting with a care partner um, that would make a difference in the way it make a difference and then also what's one thing you'd recommend for a family care partner to do so i think for for professionals who work in this space it's being sensitive to the need for those you work with to to tell and retell their story mm -hmm. and so um you know what are some ways that you can encourage that most care partners need very little encouragement to tell their story. It can be as simple as, how are you? Um, or how are you doing? Or how are you feeling? So in the, the therapy work that I do, I meet both with care partners, but I also meet with people who are living with dementia. Mm -hmm. And when you are working with someone who's living with dementia, as a professional, you have to be sensitive to not being cognitive with them. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're not going to say, well, how's your memory and your multitasking and your expressive language <laughs> skills today? And I always say when I'm doing training with a group of therapists, always default to being emotion focused. Mm -hmm. So most people may have trouble formulating thoughts, mm -hmm. but if you just ask the question even a caregiver who's under stress or duress how do you feel today you know that that you know that question the focusing on the feelings really will help facilitate telling and retelling the story i think for care partners the the one sort of takeaway of that first central need is if you don't have that person in your life you know so most counseling is not done by Mm -hmm. counselors or therapists it's done by your family members your friends your co-workers mm -hmm. you know other people who are in your life identify the person who's willing to commit the gift of their time to you and so you can talk to that person on a regular basis if you don't have that person you have a great organization here in caring kind 
and you can identify different ways in which you can connect with somebody or you can find a therapist who you know a counselor who can help you mm -hmm. kind of walk on the journey mm -hmm. but you have to have someone you can't do it alone mm -hmm. you can't do it successfully alone and, and survive the experience with your mental and physical health mm -hmm. afterward mm -hmm. so Thank you again. This is incredibly helpful. I think. Yeah. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Thank you to everyone who's coming in on Zoom. Thank you again to the Hallis family who has sponsored this annual lecture series for us. As if you're interested in hearing this kind of conversation, these kinds of webinars, we have monthly webinars. You can go to our website and see those. If there's a topic that you'd like to hear about, let us know. We'll find a speaker about that. Um, and our services are available. Our services are, are all actually available free of charge due to the generosity of the donors who support us and the grantors and the funders who support us. And so please take advantage of us. We're here for you and want to be a partner with you as you're living through your experience. So see us, give us a call on the helpline reach out via email, be in touch, and thank you so much for being here. And thank you again.